This is In the Trenches, Broadcast 24. Welcome to In the Trenches, where entrepreneurs, artists, writers, designers, inventors, warriors, and leaders share their stories of doing the hard, creative work that impacts all of our lives. Let the journey inspire you to do something worthwhile. Build something bold and create your life's work. And now, your host, Tom Morgus. Welcome back, everyone, to another broadcast of In the Trenches. Today's guest is Chad Grills. Chad is an Army infantry veteran, an entrepreneur, and an author. And kind of like myself, he also deployed to Iraq. And since then, he's left the military to pursue some entrepreneurial adventures um, and adventures, and he has a, quite a bit of experience. So I'm, I'm really excited for him to tell a story here. He's in the middle of a, a bunch of different projects. So I, I really resonate with Chad and feel like he's uh, he seems a lot like me. So so naturally I, I'm inclined to like him because he's working on so many different projects. So Chad, thanks so much for being on the show with us today. Hey Tom. So why don't we just go ahead and start with from the beginning, uh, or, or actually the way I like to start is actually like where you're at right now. Um, give a little overview of what you're working on right now, and then we'll and then we'll back it up and kind of uh, work our way toward that. Sure, sounds great. Well, I just finished my biggest project of late, which was getting married. Uh, I got married in March on March 15th, and I'm sure you know with uh, uh, you're married, right? Correct. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure you know it can be quite a, a challenge, especially when you're trying to build a business and then launch any other projects. So. I just finished that, and I launched a Kickstarter campaign for my book called Veterans Don't Reintegrate, Rebuild America. And so I'm currently in the trenches with reaching out to folks and uh, promoting the campaign. Okay, that's awesome. So when did you – so is this, let's backtrack real quick and say uh, go back to your military career a little bit and sure. what you did there and how you transitioned out. Yeah, absolutely. So I joined the military back in 2006. I – was two year college and I thought, wow, this is, this doesn't feel like real life. This doesn't feel like a challenge. And I just needed something that was substantial. And it was, uh, I was 20 years old at the time. So I joined the military and I got ready to start ROTC at my college. And I guess maybe two to three days after I got back from army basic training and infantry school, I got word that my unit was deploying. So I had a choice. I could deploy to Iraq as an enlisted soldier, or I could begin ROTC, be exempt from the deployment, and uh, that would be that, and I could finish up school. And at the time, you know, the, the surge was getting ready to wrap up, and I thought I might, which is a little bit foolish looking back, but I thought I might not get a chance to deploy if I didn't take it then. And so I chose to opt out of ROTC. I joined my unit. And uh, a few months later, we were in northern Iraq in uh, FOB Q West and uh, did a year there, came back, went to Egypt. And in 2012, I left the military to pursue some business ideas I had. Cool. Great stuff. So I'm going to I'm going to ask some questions that, are, that, that may not be interesting to anyone else but me. But <laughs> real quickly, <laughs> feel, um, feel free. Yes. Yeah, so, Sure. So, uh, Fob Q West. Okay, I am familiar. I was uh, I was actually at Liberty Victory Base Camp. And, okay, uh, great. Yeah. So, what what years were you there? There, oh seven, oh eight. Oh seven, oh eight. Okay, cool. I came in uh, around oh um, nine, ten. So we did. We were at the fourth ID and and did the uh, kind of the line haul out the last uh, combat brigade in there. So, but but familiar you. with that region. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, just absolutely. curious. So, so tell me, um, you know, you, you did that and that's kind of, you know, I, I, I guess I can't think of many people that have had that, um, choice put in front of them. Do you deploy or do you go to college, you know, or, or ROTC or whatever, you know? Yeah. It um, was very uncomfortable. <laughs> yeah. But you just sort of decided to, uh, deploy. Why, why did you do that? I decided to deploy. Uh, I didn't know I was using it at the time. It would have been much easier, but I was using what, I later learned was referred to as kind of like the regret minimization framework where I wasn't sure if I would ever have a chance to uh, test myself in such a large way. 
And I was, I knew that I might regret it if I didn't make that choice looking back. Um, whereas if I just stayed, finished school, entered ROTC, I knew a lot of the things that were going to happen. And it was kind of that draw towards uncertainty, what I was scared of. And uh, I mean, quite honestly, I, I didn't really receive any support from friends and family in this decision. <laughs> there was a uh, Oh, what happened to Chad? We thought he was smart. Why is he doing this? And uh, so there's a little bit of challenge, but I knew I wasn't going to make a career of the military. Uh, and I also knew I just had to, it just felt like something that uh, I needed. Um, so I did it. Okay, cool. I, I'm, I find that just really fascinating because I, and a lot of what you just said resonates with me in terms of being very much the same feelings that I've had about sure. uh, about wanting to join the military, about deploying, that you said something that, uh, you know, was an instant light bulb for me was you wanted to test yourself. Do you think that's a common trait among people that, uh, among military members, and, and the reasons they want to deploy is, is something along that line of wanting to, to test themselves? Absolutely. And I think that, uh, you know, before the podcast started, we were talking a little bit about anti-fragility and in modern America, there it's rare that we're privy to intense challenges, and we live and we enjoy so much comfort that I think the military is kind of like the ultimate challenge that's still out there, where it's so much more complicated than just win or lose. It's so much more complicated than politics. It's really that uh, ultimate call to put aside any excuses any BS uh, about like, you know, bemoaning the situation or should we or should we, shouldn't we be in Iraq? Those are all mute points when you have to like face the reality of here's the situation. Will I join? Will I seek to own the process and make it better? Or will I complain? So I think that all military members, I think the reason we joined is just uh, we're aspiring for something more. And uh, it really is in many ways just the the ultimate challenge. Great stuff. Okay. So you, you mentioned anti-fragility and I, I kind of want to talk about that a little bit and also tie it into, um, you know, for the listeners, Chad, you're running a, a Kickstarter campaign for a book right now that helps veterans transition out of the military. Maybe, and that's actually probably a gross generalization because I think it's a lot more than that. So tell me a little bit about the book and tell me what role your ideas on anti-fragility um, have had on the writing of it and the construction of this book and this resource. Sure. So anti-fragility has played a huge role in my life <laughs> over the last, uh, I guess since the, the book came out, uh, I've read it three or four times and the premise is applicable to create a better life and to uh, get the things that we want. So the book, uh, Veterans Don't Reintegrate, Rebuild America, is a culmination of a lot of different learning that I've done, whether it's uh, through a failed relationship uh, before, during, and after Iraq to my, consider my dream relationship that I have now that I was able to uh, build over the course of a deployment to Egypt and back. Uh, and I just, just got married to that, uh, my wife, Stephanie. Uh, but basically, these principles, I've noticed, have started to really just play a role in how I make all my decisions. And I've seen a lot of the guys that I deployed with uh, struggle when they got home. And there's so many different things that, uh, you know, we can be sometimes just be abrasive towards uh, changing. I know myself included, just wanted to do, I don't know, do something to help out and to provide what I saw as kind of like the missing component to not only reintegration, but to tackling some of the challenges that we are facing here at home in America. So I've kind of put all those together in the book. And the challenge to veterans is we have a country where the average taxpayer has $1.1 million of unfunded liabilities. And meanwhile, we have 21 million people, veterans, who possess the qualities and experiences to become the leaders and the entrepreneurs we need to rebuild the country. So tell me about that. Like, what is, what is something that, like, what can veterans do then? Tell me a little bit more about the book then. And, and, and in particular, like, what is the solution then? Um, how, and, and how do you go about, like, teaching 
uh, veterans, these, these principles of anti-fragility and how they apply to the real world? Sure. So I guess the, first and foremost, the most important principle is realizing that there's nothing wrong with uh, a, a lot of the things that veterans might perceive as weaknesses are their only strengths rate waiting to be exploited and capitalized on. So the very first thing is to shed all the uh, any type of worry, self-criticism, self-critique about what society might view as negative traits or symptoms of PTSD or symptoms of manic depression. And instead, just recognize that these are often symptoms of just natural, I mean, these are natural reactions to many of the things that we've been through. And basically never questioning for a second, all, you know, these reactions we've had as negative things. These are what psychologists tell us are actually just the precursors and in some cases, mandatory prerequisites to a phenomenon called post-traumatic growth. So anyone that we look at throughout history who has achieved something noteworthy, remarkable, or turn their dreams into reality has gone through what psychologists might say is just post-traumatic growth. And rather than reintegrate to, to a normal state or get to where they were before, this book is just all about how veterans can use those experiences to become something more. Okay, interesting. I, lo I, I love the concept of post-traumatic growth. And I guess it probably would have been more appropriate for me to uh, to explain what anti-fragility is to the audience for those who haven't read it. It's a book by uh, Nassim Taleb. I don't know if I'm pronouncing his name right, <laughs> but uh, I love his work. He's also the author of Black Swan and uh, The Bed of... Pro Procrustes. Procrustes? <laughs> yeah, Procrustes, thank Procrustes, you. Procrustes, yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. And uh, what's the other one? What am I missing here? Um, Fooled by Randomness, right? Fooled by Randomness and, and Black Swan, yeah. Yeah, and Black Swan, yeah. So great stuff, and his, his essentially his con the concepts that he that the underlying theme of what he writes about is is the the ideas of um, the stuff that's essentially the things that are that are unpredictable um, and and how they impact our lives in dramatic ways, and right. and so it, one of the things when he, he focuses on or doesn't focus on, but at least he mentions he does mention post traumatic growth, and I had never heard that term before until I'd read Anti Fragile, but it, it just like a, was a light bulb when I read it because it made sense in the context of everything else he was saying and just in real life. Um, I feel like everybody tries to make, um, tries to find, I, I don't know what it is about like these, these, like about traumatic events and try to find like where it's broken the person. But I find so many people who aren't broken by traumatic events, but become better because of them. And so I'm glad that there's a term for that now, um, as opposed to like the only option is PTSD or just, or nothing, but that there's actually right. such thing as post-traumatic growth. So <clears throat> tell me, how does, how does that now tie into, um, you, what you're what you're what you're teaching here and and how does that affect us as human beings like post post traumatic growth and I guess how do we funnel that into into something that's positive for America sure absolutely so one of the things I mentioned before you know America's obviously going through a period right now where we're we have huge huge debts that are uh, run up that we're asking uh, that either you and I or our children are going to be liable for and rather than bemoan that, it's just imperative that we create, foster, and be the leaders ourselves of a new culture, a culture that champions entrepreneurship, uh, initiative, personal responsibility. And, you know, one of the great, one of my favorite quotes from Nassim Taleb here is, uh, once again, it illustrates how veterans are in just such a good place to transform their experiences. But here's the quote. Uh, the goal of anti-fragility and what some people might refer to as modern stoicism is to transform fear into prudence, pain into information, mistakes into initiation, and desire into undertaking. And I really can't think of a more virtuous philosophy that doesn't threaten or seek to control anyone else, but instead just puts responsibility and greatness into our own hands. Bam. I love it. Great quote. So, is, okay, so we, we, we covered the book a little bit, and I'll probably want, you know, come back to that a little bit toward the end to wrap up and let people know where they can support it and pre-order it and support your Kickstarter campaign. But awesome. uh, before we get, get to that point, I want to uh, talk, talk a little bit more about your experience as you transitioned out um, veteran to civilian world, uh, 
essentially directly to entrepreneurship as I understand it. So tell me a little bit about that transition yeah. and some of the projects that you've worked on. Yeah, absolutely. So in 2012, I uh, left the military. I had just got back from a deployment to Egypt. And I had a couple ideas in my head of what I was going to do, money, but I didn't have anything definite. And I had made some investments towards the tail end of my time in the military. I got completely burned, and it was a great, great lesson. Uh, another important thing to remember is you'll always lose money investing, uh, usually, and you'll make money when you uh, spend it on your own education. And so I took the remaining portion of money that I had left for my deployments, and I started to spend it on, on educating myself about entrepreneurship, about how I could turn the amount of money I had into more money. And one of my first interests, I guess you could say, was in back in school was art, was computers, and I was definitely I was drawn to technology. And as I started to get into tech entrepreneurship a little bit and learned about it, I I guess in a matter of maybe like a month or two, found myself with a prototype of a photo sharing and uh, captions app. Uh, it was a rudimentary social network. I launched it in late August of 2012. And uh, that was kind of like my first foray into entrepreneurship. Okay, so if, if you don't mind, you do not have to, to tell this or divulge this at all. Um, sure, sure. But you said you got, you got burned investing. Can I, can I ask you what you invested in and how you got burned? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So uh, public markets and... Uh, it was just a phenomenal lesson that the average retail investor does not have <laughs> an information advantage like markets anymore. There are, I invested in uh, a medical device company quite heavily and then a few other, uh, a few other public, uh, publicly traded companies, but the medical device company in particular, I was uh, invested in <laughs> very, very heavily. They were doing very interesting work. Some of the uh, cutting edge 3D HD imaging for surgeries inside the body. Uh, they were working with another company. Uh, some of their technology had been licensed to a ISRG, which is uh, makes the Da Vinci robot. So completely fascinating stuff. I learned a lot about the market and uh, I actually was offered a job by the CEO of the company that I had invested in. Uh, uh, after they were sold. And it was a great learning experience, but I also ended up losing some money because I didn't know enough about uh, how to exit positions and uh, a, pain, a painful experience, but one I'll always remember. Awesome. That's okay. Sorry. I was just so curious about that. I wanted to, to, to find out. And it's so funny that it's also in, in the stock market as well. I've, I've been through my, my burners <laughs> on that as well. Yeah, uh, and then and then I actually, as a result, I got into uh, to more options trading. But that's just another story altogether. That's which, probably the safest bet that the retail yeah. investor has to uh, to make any money or create, hedge or create wealth. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, otherwise, I, I I completely agree. I may even be borderline um, uh, conspiracy theorist on it. The fact that it's completely um, uh, un. un uncontrollable and un, um, unpredictable uh, to the retail investor uh, unless you're an insider. But we don't have to get into that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> we can't so, okay. next time. There's, uh, there's plenty, <laughs> to t plenty to talk about. <laughs> exactly. So, okay. So, you, you, you learned your lesson and then you, you invested heavily in education. Um, yeah. and then, and then, but, but, but beyond education, you actually put this stuff to work. You, you, started, you created your own products. So, tell me a little bit about your experience at you know, starting, finishing, and shipping um, products and and. And, and projects and shipping sure. them to market. Sure. So the uh, first uh, application, the first mobile app I built was I had done some research about the market and decided there was a big opportunity for a caption uh, app, but also one that had photo filters. And so I started to go about sketching out some wireframes, which anyone who's interested in technology, this is one of the very first steps that it's... Uh, it's not sophisticated, so many people overlook it, but these simple steps that aren't sophisticated are actually the best ways to learn. So I just became proficient at ideas, and after a few uh, notebooks of scribbled ideas, I, I had the basis for 
what would become our first uh, caption and uh, photo sharing app. And I say our, uh, my now wife, then fiance and I were uh, putting this together together. And we noticed that uh, one of the first things I noticed was that Instagram had about you know, 80% of the total pictures that were taken and, and shared through only came from about eight different photo filters. And so I was trying to create basically a simplified version of that, but also one that used a little bit of uh, machine learning to apply a relevant caption to the picture. And then we were trying to do some cool things with location-based uh, tagging and, and things of that nature. But after I had the wireframes, uh, we went, reached out, hired a contractor uh, who was proficient in Objective-C, the language needed to uh, release on that. And uh, in a couple of weeks, we had a prototype. Okay, so tell me, you have the prototype, now what do you do with it? Yeah, so we uploaded it to, and there was a little bit of, uh, for anyone who's thinking about launching any sort of technology product now, having growth built in or what Eric Reese, uh, author of The Lean Startup, might refer to as a viral coefficient is just an absolute mandatory thing to do. And we didn't have that built in at the time. That was a lesson learned. But for anyone out there who might be thinking about doing something in technology now, a mandatory thing is uh, the viral coefficient. And what that is, is when a single user uses your product, they are there's a good chance that they will share it with a friend. So for every single user you bring in, you're going to bring in uh, another user. That's the basic, uh, it's the foundation of, uh, of the buzzword, you know, growth hacker, or, uh, you know, a lot of people t- are talking about growth hacking, replacing marketing. So we didn't have that in the first version. And in any, any sort of technology product now, it's an absolute mandatory to have. Okay, yeah, I, I completely agree. Um, it's funny, because it doesn't have to be just tech, though. Um, I, I think it applies beyond the tech space, although it's cer- certainly mandatory. Right. Yeah, but it's just that that idea that if you're going to create something, it's got to be something that's shareable. Uh, and 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 if you can build it into something where it, like the sharing is like mandatory or something like that, without being invasive or distracting or degrading the quality of, of said technology or app, that's probably best bet. But uh, I mean, you know, just Absolutely. for anything we do, even if it's writing a book, you know, this this book that you're writing, there's got to be some kind of viral coefficient to it. Um, and whether that's the story that pushes it on. Um, whether it's the the purpose behind it, it it's got to be integrated in it. I, I know it's it's slightly different. It's it's probably maybe a gross generalization, but but I think that's the reality of it. I, I think I think it's a very accurate, our, yeah, very yeah. very accurate uh, gener- yeah generalization. That's very true across yeah. all verticals. Yeah. So now tell me, is this the company that got a cease and desist letter? <laughs> yes. Yes, it is. And uh, tell me about that. <laughs> the uh, I didn't really know after we launched the app what direction to take it. I had been in contact as I went along the process with a, uh, a r- really fascinating character who would later become a mentor. And uh, he is right now, who, he's also a venture capitalist and an expert in the tech field. So he was uh, enduring some of my emails <laughs> asking like, well, you know, what should I do next? And I, re- I took some of his advice along with my own and reached out to a larger company that I thought might be interested in. Uh, purchasing the app. And it wasn't, uh, I mean, we didn't have a huge user base. It was not nothing to uh, jump up and down about. But what we did have was a pretty good conversion from free to paid inside the app. And I reached out to a larger company that had some similar apps and they had a lot of traffic to their websites and various web properties online. And I just basically pitched them, hey, you know, this engine, it fits with your audience. And, uh, I just waited to hear back. I thought I might get a uh, a no or, uh, you know, thanks for contacting us, but we're not interested at this time. Instead, I had a letter from their attorney that said, uh, actually, take the app down. And uh, it was a harsh but very good wake-up call. Well, can you, can, you know, I, it's something I'm sure a lot of people haven't gone through. Um, I, I would be nervous of going through that myself if that ever came to, to that point. What it, it, I don't understand. Why would they? Why would they say that? What was what was so offensive about your app that it required a cease and desist? Sure. So we had four letters in our name of the app that were also used in one of their other apps. Not purposefully done. Not 
maliciously done, nothing of the sort. Um, and those letters were the, uh, the foundation of the letter, uh, for, uh, the foundation of the cease and desist. And it basically said, this is, uh, you know, messing up our trademark, uh, or it infringes, I forget the exact, uh, text from their attorney. Um, but they forwarded also to Apple. And so we had a choice to, uh, dispute it or ask for further details or Apple gave us the option to remove it from the app store and not face any further actions or, or further repercussions, I guess. Um, so it was very murky, very unnerving. One of those things where you're like, I, uh, I'd love more details, but I also don't want to, I'm not invested enough in this project where I'm ready to, you know, go down with credit cards maxed out fighting some legal battle that i don't know how to win. <laughs> yeah, no, I was gonna. I mean, it's just. I guess it's just sad because I do. I've heard of these type of things happening in in all cases, and also uh, I, this is one of the first though I've I've talked directly about somebody receiving that from from a tech or a, from an application. And I guess yeah. it's just. It's I guess the sad part is just that I I feel like it, it. There's probably really, and I who knows, but but I'm just saying from from the. From my perspective, it sounds like these people, like this this group that you you emailed, it sounds like it's just like the kind of pressure they put on on others to keep their market position, to keep themselves absolutely. Um, yeah, and that's that's offensive to me. Again, as an entrepreneur and as a little guy, I hate it when I, I hear stuff like that um, because it makes you think, oh, how can you win? So that said, how can you win? You you got you got this letter. What did you do next? And yeah, how you can win is so important. And I think the ultimate answer is choosing battles in such a way that the battle doesn't have a high likelihood of, you know, destroying you. Or in this case, you know, in the business world and entrepreneurship, it would be avoiding, uh, like, you know, avoiding bankruptcy. It would be whatever capital an aspiring entrepreneur might have, the best way to maximize your chances of success is to enable yourself to run as many small tests as possible, or to, as I'm starting to do now, set up a platform for my work where I can uh, promote various projects, launch various uh, things like the Kickstarter project, which I'm doing now. And as entrepreneurs, we need to give ourselves as much exposure to the upside while limiting our downside. That's basically it. Exactly. Couldn't agree more. Um, and that's a topic I actually, I, I'm really excited to to write more about and research more about uh, because again, I think there's that's not enough content on anti fragility in, in business and entrepreneurship. Um, I think you know Taleb touches on it, but there's so much to it that would be, I think, truly profound um, for those for artists and entrepreneurs. Absolutely, uh, just the fundamental philosophy behind it. It's really empowering and it's it's just great. So that said. You are running a Kickstarter campaign right now. Um, where can people reach out and contribute and support your work, support this book, support veterans, and uh, and get you, get this funded? Yeah, absolutely. They can reach out to, if they just go to uh, chadgrills.com, you can see details of the project. Of uh, I just posted the Kickstarter video there. They can go to Kickstarter and search for veterans. It'll be the first thing that comes up. And... Uh, the basic to sum up the philosophy of the book, it's a path to thrive in the 21st century. Uh, and it starts with a simple acronym, uh, PRSE. And it's an acronym that anyone who, whether they're reintegrating, battling uh, substance abuse, battling a failing relationship in debt, I think it's a really uh, powerful acronym. It, it's basically personal health, then relationships, then skills. And then finally, entrepreneurship. But it basically advocates taking care of yourself first, then taking care of your relationships, then making sure you have the necessary skills to pay the bills and everything else. And from that platform, accessing entrepreneurship in a sustainable way is not only possible, but it's very profitable, probable for Beth. Great stuff. So I, I suppose on that note... Um, one last question, then we'll wrap it up. Um, and and as far as as far as vets when they're they're transitioning out, um, and, and this is this is particularly for vets. Um, I'm working on a uh, a membership site right now, um, kind of training membership transition site for vets. Um, Highspeedloaddrag.org and highspeedelite.com for those interested. Uh, for those vets listening, check it out or just reach out to me. And I 
as I'm putting together, so I'm doing a lot of interviews and talking to a lot of veterans to find out what they need and what, what type of training they need, what kind of support they need, what they're looking for. From your perspective, what have you found? What have you discovered as you write this book? You're obviously taking it from your own, uh, your own experiences, but have you, have you done market research in that respect? Have you talked to veterans and, and have you found out what, what they, what they need and what the solution is for them? Yeah, I, uh, I have. And I, whether it's, uh, my experiences when I've still been in or talking to friends who are still in the military now or transitioning, I think that a, uh, condensing a lot of and filtering a lot of the information out there to the uh, you know Pareto principle uh, or minimum effective dose of good stuff would just be, a, I mean, it would basically just be personal health. And uh, starting from that standpoint and experimenting with things like I've done, whether they're no alcohol, no gluten, uh, trying meditation and feeling, feeling ridiculous, even uh, you know, isolating yourself a little bit because you're trying so many of these experiments, <laughs> but just running a series of experiments with your own health where, you know, you go 30 days with meditating or you go 30 days without alcohol just as a test is so, so important to getting to completely eliminating any sort of anxiety and giving yourself a foundation for everything else. That's, that's great stuff. I, I, I resonate with that as well. Um, coming back from deployment and, and definitely not saying that I went through anything as dramatic as a lot of the other people I know, but, um, but just feeling that kind of, uh, um, disconnect between, you know, myself and the rest of the world in some ways. And I did exactly that without, without knowing it, without knowing those techniques, but it was like, I just went inside and I was like, okay, well, I'll just, I'm going to start working out more. I'm going to start, um, eating healthier or whatever, you know? And it's funny because it's probably in looking back on it retrospectively, it's probably the healthiest thing I could have possibly done as opposed to going the opposite end where it's trying to, to add, um, things into my life, right. Yeah. Add at, yep. whether it's drinking or food or binge, you know, it's, it's funny. It's like when I think when it's actually, that's kind of a principle of anti-fragility, isn't it? It's, it's, it's take out, take things away before you yeah. add to, right. It's simplify yeah. before you make more complex. Um, no, you're absolutely and, right. Yeah. And it's actually funny cause that, I think that ties in everything we've been talking to about entrepreneurship too. It's how do you find, you know, that one product, how do you remove the superfluous? How do you find the core of it? Yeah. And for, for veterans, especially we're so geared towards a lot of the messages we receive are, you know, be aware of those who are isolating themselves or, you know, be careful if you're, you know, going out on your own or, you know, taking too much time alone. Well, in reality, after the deployment, after the never ending uh, inputs that come from a deployment, so many things that we can't control and never ending stimulus of that, I, I like to call it strategic isolation. Strategic isolation can actually be when you're working on becoming healthier, it can be completely transformative. And it's something that's often overlooked because we associate it with uh, depression or it's really nothing could be further from the truth. Great stuff, Chad. Well, hey, man, I really appreciate having you on the show. Really powerful. Um, I, it's, just, it's, it's just funny because so many things you said were just like light bulbs in my head. I'm like, yes, exactly. I've, I've read many of the same books um, and have many of the same opinions and, and, and find that the stuff you're saying is, is spot on. So for those listening, um, oh, thanks so much. Man. Yeah. Yeah, of course. And, you know, I know it's probably geared this mostly towards, uh, towards veterans and a lot of the, the talks we've been, um, discussing, but I think a lot of the stuff is applicable beyond that. Um, to anybody really, uh, especially when you're talking about post-traumatic growth and things like that, that it's not just veterans that experience uh, traumatic, um, events in life. Um, but that, that a lot of people go through traumatic stuff and that, that there's ways to leverage that into positive change in the world. But, um, that said, hey, man, thank you so much for being on the show. I think it's great. Um, again, uh, people can reach out to you at chadgrills.com and uh, support his campaign, support his Kickstarter. That should be, uh, it's live right now uh, as of this, uh, this recording and when we publish this. In about a week, I'm going to try to expedite this. So when you guys hear this, it should be, it, it'll still be current. So please reach out and, and, and um, contribute to Chad's Kickstarter campaign for his book. And uh, thank you so much for being on the show, Chad. Hey, it was exciting to be here, Tom. Thanks so much. And that wraps up In the Trenches, Broadcast 24. If you'd like to check out the show notes, just go to tommorcus.com slash broadcast24. And that's the number 24. And for all the veterans in the audience, if you enjoyed today's conversation, you should definitely check out highspeedelite.com. Highspeedelite.com is an exclusive veterans mastermind network and training site designed to help veterans like you succeed in the civilian world, either by landing the dream job you deserve or building your dream business from scratch. This program is being developed and led by John Lee Dumas, 
Antonio Centeno, and myself. If you don't know John or Antonio, they are both incredibly successful entrepreneurs who have built million-dollar businesses, and they both care very much about helping other veterans succeed. And HighSpeedElite.com is our way of giving back and making that a reality. So if you're transitioning out of the military, considering transitioning out, or you've already entered the civilian workforce but would love a better job or would love to build your own business, then definitely check out HighSpeedElite.com. I'd love to see you there. If you have any questions, just reach out and email me. I always respond. Thanks so much, and until next time, this is Tom Morcus. If you're listening to this, you are the resistance. Thank you for listening to In the Trenches. Your creative work doesn't stop here. Join the resistance, the small but growing army of entrepreneurs and artists putting a dent in the world at www.tommorcus.com. Never fight alone. Join the resistance.